This is Amateur Logic, episode 181, for May 26, 2023. Amateur Logic is brought to you by ICOM. Aim higher and discover the world of SHF. Explore the world of microwave with ICOM's new SHF portable, the IC905. This all-mode rig covers 144 to 5600 megahertz and with the optional CX-10G transferter, 10 gigahertz. Recorder rolling. Yeah, where is the red light showing that we're recording? It's on his side. And, and where's the dude that goes, action? Action. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. I'm Emil. And I'm Mike. It's good to be back with you. We have special coverage tonight. It's called uh, George and Mike's Excellent Adventure. It's sort of a takeoff of of the one we did a few years ago. And Tommy didn't come to Hamvention this year. Emil didn't come. Um. But Mike and I did, and uh, I don't know, maybe near 20,000 other folks, give or take a little bit. I'm not sure how many they had this year, but it was a good crowd. It was it was really crowded on a Friday night. Really? Or for a Friday afternoon. I caught afternoon myself anyway. looking for the numbers, but they must not post them yet. I haven't seen them. Yeah, I haven't. I lost count after I ran out of fingers, so can't help you there. Yeah, it was um, it was a good crowd this year, and Mike and I had a good time. Uh, Chip was there too, K nine MIT. I hate I miss Chip. Uh, Jeff was there, K eight JTK. Yeah, uh, of course Ray was there. A lot of folks were there. Uh, some folks that we usually see were not there this year. Uh, Bob Hall wasn't there. Uh, Gordo wasn't there. But you know, there's a new technology that's out there now. That kind of would enhance that video for you. Yeah. Tell me about it. Well, I'm not sure that we would want to use it on a video from Hera Arena. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, I don't think we have to worry about that anymore. But it's uh, the first news item up tonight. It's something that Mike brought us tonight. you want to tell us about it, Mike? I don't know if you guys remember Odorama. <laughs> I think it was in high school, there was a um, a movie out. I don't even know if you could call it a movie. It was called Polyester. And when you bought your ticket at the theater, they, they handed you one of these scratch and sniff cards. And a number would flash up on the screen at various points during the film. And then you were supposed to scratch and sniff this card with the corresponding <laughs> number that shows up on the screen. Well, flash forward a couple of decades, well, at least one and a half decades anyway, we're now looking at virtual re- reality and they they now have all factory or factor generators that uh, create uh, the sense and, and um, inject them into the mask as you're as you're viewing the VR. So it's kind of it's kind of a, a take and I don't know if we don't uh, we don't have the actual uh, live link, but if you um, go to the site and read the article, you'll see, the whole history about smell a vision and it's pretty interesting and slightly humorous the the things that they the, the goofy things that they try to uh, throughout the years yeah it's interesting i remember years and years ago they were talking about having 4d theaters where you wore the 3d glasses and the sh- chairs shook and and uh they had these uh things that like misted like lemon if there was lemon on the screen and things like that for experience i'm sure and, and obviously never took off but i remember seeing some stuff about that probably back in this late 70s all maybe. i remember is the uh 
the, the movie Polyester was the closest thing I can compare it to is kind of a bad rendition of uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. It really <laughs> didn't make any sense. You could tell that they they put the script together in order to correspond with all the various scratch and sniff things that they had on the card. <laughs> but uh, it was it was kind of a novelty, and uh, it was it was kind of neat to experience at least once. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it won any Oscars that year, though. Mm, probably. I, I wouldn't think so. No. Well, the first thing, well, this is, we didn't actually shoot this the first thing, which often happens when we're at Hamvention. The intro doesn't actually get shot. <laughs> when the show opens? Yeah, when the show opens. Here we are at Hamvention 2023. And it's good to be back this year. It's good to have Mike, the E3 MIC, here as a co-host at Hamvention this year. Tommy couldn't make it. Emil couldn't make it, but hey, we've got it covered. We do, and uh, it's too bad, too, because Emil, I found some tables that had your name on it free. I saw that, yeah. That was a good find. Have you made any purchases yet? I made some small purchases. Uh, I have a couple more to, to, to do before I leave today. And um, other than that, nothing major. How about yourself? I bought a uh, just a tinned end uh, curly mic cable. I need to replace them. I see 7,000, the old and the jacket splitting off of it. But uh, that and right God there, pork chop sandwich. You've got to try that, man. I do. I've heard nothing but good things about it. It's a, it's a must. I, I think that replaced the famous Bratz. Mike, you never did try that pork chop sandwich, did you? <gasps> I I didn't. I, I ended oh, up Mike. spending all my extra money on AA batteries. So. Tell me this isn't so. <laughs> you didn't try the Corley Mike cables either, did you? Oh, man. <laughs> that's that's no. my... Uh, purchase from the show right there i've got to put my ends on it though for my ic7000 man yeah you can't miss you know you're gonna to have to go back next year then to get the pork chop sandwich yeah you should have got george yeah to ship I, you I, one I, too. I must say we're we were missing a, a few things obviously we're missing you tommy and emil but also um i'll have to go for the full experience next time and go for the pork yeah, it and it's even better than the, I used to go for the brats. I used to say, anybody going ham vention, you got to have the brats. But um, apparently, the pork chop sandwich is where it's at. Oh yeah, yep. By by far, the line was always pretty long every time. You know, I walked by there, but I did stand in line and get one, and it was tasty. Well, it's worth the, it's yeah. worth waiting in the line for. You know, this uh, last year I bought emails. This was his year to buy them. Oh, that's why he didn't come. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I only had that one dollar that year. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> Who goes to the convention with one dollar in their pocket? <laughs> yeah, and and the pork chop sandwich place clearly has a sign that says cash only. So. <laughs> Anyway, first thing I shot when I got there was what you see when you first walk in the door, some some outdoor rigs, uh, portable setups, and one in particular I want you to pay attention to here. If you're going to do portable rover, you might as well get serious about it. Here's a nice setup right here. I'm not even sure what bands he's operating. I'm guessing... Maybe six meters, two meters, 440, and something above that. I don't know, maybe 900. And here's the Aries truck for Shelby County, Ohio. And I like this at the back of the trailer there. You can see they've got a pneumatic mast with, looks like on top of it is a dual band collinear antenna and a place to hang a wire antenna as well now here is a loop I'm not sure what band that's on I hope I'm not pointing my camera at the Sun I don't know 
maybe 40 meters. And another pneumatic mass there with some nice antennas on top. Looks like a hex beam up there and a Yagi of some type. Oh, this looks like a, um, a lot of VHF antennas on, on this mast. And a little HF. I'm here with Danny. What was your call again, Danny? November 0, Sierra Papa November, N0 SPN, Rover. <laughs> rover, okay. That's right. That's my rover rig right there. We're going to turn around and look at it in a moment. Sure. Um, I like some of what you've done there. Uh, homebrew kind of combination of use what you got, huh? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, making antenna stuff for me is uh, the most favorite part of the hobby for me, being able to just make stuff with what you got. Exactly. You know, it's not as great as a lot of the fantastic stuff you can buy, but it's cheap and it's fun. And it's a lot quicker if you already got the stuff. Yes, that's right. That's right. And then you can make it to design whatever your specific needs are. Exactly. And you were telling me about your QRP rig here. Let's get yeah, a shot I'm of that. A lot of fun with QRP stuff uh, uh, on HF, separate from the VHF rover stuff. But uh, uh, I designed just a just a little a little QRP rig that I use. I just used this little cheap box that I picked up at uh, Harbor Freight. And uh, on the outside here, I've just got a uh, power switch because there's a built-in battery in there that I'll show you. And uh, the coax connector. And this little power plug here I use for uh, plugging in for charging the battery that's in here. But uh, it just opens up. And uh, I don't know if you can see that okay, but this is just yeah. one of these little tiny inexpensive uh, Chinese made uh, uh, eight band QRP uh, transceivers. It, uh, it cost, I think, a total of about $125 through Walmart online. Wow. Unbelievable <laughs> that you can buy radios uh, just through Walmart now. And it works way better than I ever expected it would. What brand is that? Um, you know, it's kind of a generic, no brand name. Uh, if you Google or go on to YouTube and put USDX Plus, uh, you'll see this radio. And this is kind of like a second version of it. I had one of the first versions, but it didn't work well at all. So I returned that, which is easy to do when you buy them through Walmart. And, uh, but this one here has been great. And I just use a little speaker mic with it. It does come with a little uh, speaker, but it's so tiny that it doesn't work very well. But this works great and uh, I have just a little battery pack in there and uh, when you uh, just use a little plug-in headphones for here it works great and uh, just with this little case here I can carry uh, the little spiral pad that I use for logging I've used this for many parks on the air activations where you just set up and you want just something quick and fast and easy um, with QRP, as you know, those of you that, that uh, do QRP, the reception is always great, but sometimes the transmitting is a little harder. <laughs> so what kind of wattage do you get with that rig? Is it five? Well, it's only about five watts. Five watts. About five yeah. watts. And um, uh, depending on what kind of an antenna I use, uh, it gets out better or worse depending on what I use. If I have like just a, a little small ham stick on top of my vehicle, that doesn't work as good as I have a little portable uh, inverted V that I use for 20 and 40 meters that's real fast going up and down. When I use that, it gets out remarkably good, especially when the band conditions are good. So, wow. uh, you know, you can have a lot of fun for hardly any investment at all. Well, let's take a look at your antenna farm over here. Sure, sure. I do a lot of VH rover activity for VHF contesting which is in the higher frequency band. And uh, I have a much larger rover set up like some of you have seen um, with um, uh, you know, the really big antenna rays up on top of the vehicles. But I decided I, I, I wanted to try something smaller and more compact. And, uh, um, and like I said, the, one of the most favorite part of the hobbies for me is making antenna stuff. 
So I had a lot of fun with this. This is a, just a small uh, six element uh, uh, Yagi beam for 432. And this is just a small four element beam for two meters. And this is a horizontal dipole for six meters that I made out of two three foot CB antennas that I just pulled the end off and then you just pull wire out until you get it tuned to six meters. And I did the same thing with another even shorter old CB antenna uh, that I use for a six meter vertical dipole. And I have a little NMO mount uh, dual band uh, uh, vertical FM antenna for two meter and uh, 70 centimeters. And that little antenna there, that's an old two meter five eighths that I fiddled with and I got that to work really well for 220. And um, um, so it works great and uh, it, it's fast and it's easy. And I purposely designed it to be small and simple um, uh, in part as a demonstration for other people to see that while it's great to have some of these really big gigantic rover rigs and they're amazing but you can get out and have fun with a small inexpensive VHF ro rover rig and have just a ton of fun working VHF contesting without um, such a big investment or being so super serious. So on the um, on the two meter antenna there okay. I think I recognize a few of those parts tell me what you made that with <laughs> and what it cost. <laughs> well it cost me almost nothing. Uh, the, the aluminum beam part is, uh, is uh, just a beam that came off of an old uh, free uh, uh, TV antenna mass that I picked up at a, at, at a, at a garage sale. And uh, off of that same mast, some of the elements on the old TV antenna are what I use to make the elements for the 70 centimeter beam. And inside each of those, I just push in a little wooden dowel and cut that off and that strengthens them up so that they can take a lot of abuse without getting bent. These elements here I took off of one of my eight element two meter beams. I uh, often use two eight element beams stacked vertically uh, with a phasing harness um, for uh, uh, two meter work and uh, so I just grabbed one of those and I pulled the elements off just to attach it onto this and I had to kind of fiddle a little bit with the spacing uh, to get the SWR down but but it worked great. So how are you matching this thing? I'm looking here and I know that's not a, uh, a 75 to 300 ohm ballon there but how are you matching that? It's just a straight dipole. It's all it is. Just a coax fed dipole and uh, uh, you have to kind of fiddle with it to get the SWR down good enough. Uh, on each of these antennas, I got the SWR down to a little over one to one, wow. set up separate away from the rig. But when I put them all together, kind of close, it kind of it kind of fiddles with the S with the SWR. And so, like right now, this one is probably about one and a half right now, and this one here is probably about two to one right now. The, uh, the six element dipole, that's probably about one and a half as well. But you know, plenty good, good enough to get out and have fun. It looks like a fun time to me, Danny. I like some of the tricks you did to strengthen up the elements and, and use what you got. Tie wraps, piece of old TV antennas, <laughs> yep. uh, electric tape, just whatever you have, you can build something. Oh yeah, and, and again, I'm not trying to say that you know, the stuff that you can get commercially uh, isn't good because it is. It's all great. It's, it's fantastic equipment that's been designed by professionals and it works really well. But, um, you know, for me, again, the most favorite part of the hobby for me is just making stuff, making the antenna stuff, just from whatever you can find. Oh, that, and uh, and uh, that's what makes it fun. Uh, there's uh, something to be said for rolling your own. And I, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I kind of like that. Everything I've got's been modified or oh, yeah. or built or something yep. one way or another. Yep. So, yep. I appreciate you talking with us. Interesting setup here, and maybe it'll give some other people inspiration to to get out and build something. Sure. And for uh, anyone who's never tried to be a VHF rover.
I'm on a mission to try to recruit more rovers in VHF contesting, and you don't even have to have sideband. The, uh, uh, you can get out even with just a, a, a little dual band HT and a roof mag mount, and just cruise around to uh, different uh, uh, towns and areas where they have uh, repeaters and just shout out your location on the repeater and, and, uh, and ask them to move to a simplex frequency and you've got contacts and uh, it's a lot of fun. Or it is. Thanks. Hey, you bet. Thanks for stopping by, George. Comment on Danny's antenna set up there. <laughs> that was enthusiastic and cheap. I love it. I thought you would. That was a pretty nice setup. It's robust. It, it looks pretty tough. Yeah, it, and it economical too. Uh -huh, I especially. have some some footage of the inside of his vehicle, the the radios that he had in there and such. But uh, you know, we have to kind of edit it down so we can fit all this into one show, and it's still going to run long tonight. But anyway, I'm out of, out of all those nice portable setups there that's the one that i wanted to take a closer look at yeah i see why yeah oh yeah and you said uh off, off camera here we were saying uh, i asked how he had that mounted trailer yeah. hitch right yeah tell me about the trailer hitch yeah it, it, the car he had they don't offer one of those um hitches on it what do you call it receiving receiver hit? yeah they don't offer that for the car he was driving so he made one himself yeah and that's what awesome. he was using for the mount so uh that's very it, cool it checked all the boxes email yep that's awesome yep next up here we've got uh, some video well you know ray was there ray is always there. oh yeah and they had some new things going on at icom this year here's um we're going to break this into two parts so here's the first part of the new stuff that ICOM had this year at Hamvention. Ray, it's good to see you again in Hamvention this year. Oh man, it's great to be seen. It's been been incredible the last, what, day and a half now? Well, hadn't it been? Friday was just off the chart. Yes, it was. I think that was the busiest Friday. And, and really with, with what you've done and all the other guys that are on YouTube and social media, all I could focus on was my immediate eight foot ring. I mean, there were so many people coming by, uh, talking about seeing me on your channel and, and what we've been doing and telling us to keep up the good work with you. So, hey, cool. thank you for making us famous. Well, that's great. Thank you for making us famous, too. Now, you guys have been there a lot, a lot longer than what we have been, but greatly appreciate it. And talk on it, Tommy, we miss you. Yeah, fortunately we got uh, Mike here with us running the camera today. So if there's any issues at all, you, you'll know who to address it to. What's been hot this this year, right? Well, two things, well, three things really, and you'll have to shoot video a little bit later on some of it. Well, the hottest thing has been the 905. We finally are starting to ship them. Uh, we've got units up where people can see what you really do with them. and. Getting the concept, the, the the RF unit that's on the table is not connected to anything. So they're like, well, what's it driving? And as soon as we show them, that's what it looks like up on the tower. Immediately you see the, the wheels processing going on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you know what you can do with that. And I, everything's right there. No loss, any feed line. It's what, run Cat 5 to it and you're good? Uh, it comes with, we've got two different cables, one 60 meters long and the other one's 20 meters long. Um, but this is what's going to be interesting is when I come visit you and Tommy and you make that comment, eh, you know what, I really don't, I don't see me wanting one of these. And then we play around with the scope so you can see the activity that you've got in your neighborhood and that might convince you again. Oh yeah, there could be some stuff hiding out up there I don't know about. Yeah, I remember with the 9700, that conversation, and immediately the, when we started talking to people and you were starting to think about how far away they were and the antenna that we were using um, kind of surprised you. Well, and when I saw the band scope and we found a new repeater I didn't even know was there. There you go. So that's, that's part of the fun. And the, the next one is the ID50. And uh, it 
people have been asking where does it really fit in and it's for those that have the ID31 wanting to upgrade or that have the the 51 series it's it's pretty much parallel with the 51 with some of the features but also it has some of the features from the 52 but it's not going to be at the 52 price point no sir it's not FCC certified yet and no we do not have pricing I'm hoping by the end of summer did I answer all those questions I think you did and I like the way I like the size of it because I've got a 51 and I've got a 52 as well and you know me I really like the 52 because of that color screen yes sir but it's a pricier radio this is compact easy to hold and um, yeah, I could see this being very popular. Yeah, and, and we've, we've titled it the, the Perfect Travel Companion because for whatever reason, people want to take care of the color screen. They look at this one and go, oh, how do, this, this one looks like rough and ready and rugged. So it, it's been fun talking to people and getting their input back on where this radio really fits in. Well, I have the, the 51A 50th anniversary edition with the blue front. I, I, I like the way this one looks better. I mean, well, because I'm used to a 52 now, and this is operates virtually the same, just a couple of features different. Yeah, when you go into the set menu, I mean, one of the thing, things that you notice is that it's got the, the GUIs now instead of all the text. Yeah. So that's definitely out of the 52. The band scope and... Um, but one of the great features that hasn't changed is the GPS control of your repeater memories. So everybody, when you say DR mode, everybody thinks digital repeaters. But the DR mode works great for FM repeaters too. It's just in that mode of, and I will take you to it real quick, George. We go down here, it says we're, I got a, it's searching for a GPS. I push the blue button. It says near repeater, near repeater all, DV, or FM. So if I tell it all, and it's going to say the last time I caught it was here in Dayton, but I can then scan the repeaters, and it scans all the repeaters in the area, like the ID5100. So you're not really going to need that repeater book anymore. You got it right there in your hand. Yes, and with the way the guys from the Georgia D-Star group have been updating dstarinfo.com, when I first found this in my trunk, I I saved to the to the SD card the memory the memory for the repeaters, sent it over to Ed and John. Within an hour, they go, "We got it on the site." Wow, and you just found this in your trunk recently, too. Yes, sir. Yes, this was about two weeks ago. Very cool. It was very cool. It's kind of dark up in Canada right now, but we expect Mike will be back here with us shortly. <laughs> Must have had a brownout up there or something. I, I think so. We did visit with a lot of folks this year at Hamvention, and oh. one of our favorites, I didn't noticed him in the chat room tonight. He may not be in here tonight. But y'all will probably recognize this guy. Well, Chip, we finally did it. We finally met up. Yep, we did after uh, how many years now? Uh, seven years, six years? Yeah, I would say it's at least that. Uh, yeah, it's really great. Finally, finally got to meet you. Finally got to meet you and, and uh, enjoyed all the times uh, on Amateur Logic TV watching you and George and the boys. Of course, you're 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 a veteran. When I say veteran, I mean hamvention wise. So you've been going to hamvention for how many years? I went to my first hamvention right after I got married in 1972 at the Hera Arena. I didn't get married at the Hera Arena. I, that's where the hamvention was at the time. But uh, been coming uh, periodically ever since then. Oh, very good. Yeah, I uh, you got me beat. I think I started going in the early 80s, and. Uh, Things certainly changed since then, haven't they? Yeah, and, and I like this venue a lot better with the uh, the, the separate pavilions. Uh, everything seems to be a little more organized. It wasn't as chaotic as Hera, although Hera served its purpose for years, that's for sure. I think they started in 53 or 56, something like that. And uh, uh, I just like this layout here. It's uh, And we couldn't have asked for a better day today. It's great. 
No, I, I don't know if uh, anybody caught my comment on the last Amateur Logic segment, but uh, I was counting on the law of averages because I think every, for I don't know how many years, it's almost guaranteed rain on a Hamvention weekend, and we pretty much lucked out this weekend. Yeah, well, well, the rain man came last night while we were in bed sleeping, so it worked out great. It was fabulous. Yep. Yeah, and there's a few puddles around, but uh, other than that, the grass is probably dry now. It wasn't like a soggy mess when we got here. So, anyway, Chip, glad we made it. Glad to meet you, Mike, and, and uh, I hope we can do it some more. Yeah, for sure. And there was more to that, Mike. You may remember I, I asked you uh, to do an introduction, and you and Chip went on for um, <laughs> a, a good while longer after that. Unfortunately, the little mic connector on the wireless mic popped a loose. I just heard a pop, and then there was no hey, audio. That sounds that sounds sort of, I don't know if I didn't know better, that sounds like it was not entirely an accident. Well, <laughs> let me say, it didn't only happen to you, it happened to me, too. Um, uh, so I ordered some of those new connectors now that, uh, uh, the mini plug that plugs in, and it's got the it's a little twist, twist, thing twist screws down. Screw, yeah. yeah, so that won't happen again, but... Uh, we didn't really miss anything um, super important. I don't think because I couldn't tell what y'all were saying. You look like you're having a good time, though. Well, well, you know, Chip and I had a lot to catch up on, so yeah. um, I I shouldn't say that. We we keep in touch uh, via via email mostly, but um, it was the uh, certainly the first time we met in person, which was uh, really great. Yeah, I think he's in the okay. chat room. I know I saw him a little while ago in there. Yeah, yeah, he's in there. Okay. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment because we've just barely skimmed the surface on our excellent adventure at Dayton Hamvention this There's year. more so adventure to come. It's more adventure. Don't go away. Aim higher and discover the world of SHF. Explore the world of microwave with ICOM's new SHF portable, the IC905. This all-mode rig covers 144 to 5600 megahertz and with the optional CX-10G transferter, 10 gigahertz. This portable also has a few industry first under its belt. The IC905 is the first radio to support the five major bands, VHF to SHF, a power over Ethernet RF module for flexible installation and is compatible with amateur TV in analog FM mode. Other features include large 4.3-inch color LCD touchscreen, real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, easy digital mode settings, included high-performance GPS antenna, full D-Star functions, including DV and DD mode, and SD memory card slot. For more information about ICOM's amateur offerings, visit icomamerica.com amateur. Thanks, ICOM. Yep, appreciate that. And I, I did I did talk with Ray for a minute. Uh, I think it was on the Friday, um, and uh, he had a good point. Um, you know those uh, super high frequency or super high frequency bands that uh, we're generally not losing using. Um, they're underutilized by by any stretch, but um, if we don't start using them, we're we're risking losing those bands. So mm -hmm. it, it's really great to see companies like ICOM. <laughs> Taking the risk and uh, and making equipment that we can use on those higher frequencies. Yeah, and there's there's a lot more to that than you would think, and, and that'll be discussed a little later. Yeah, in the show here. I don't know of anybody else. There may be, but I don't know of anybody else that makes it gear for up there. Mm, most of the people working those bands are using transverters, and there's a, a big advantage that this rig's got over using a transferter, but uh, that'll be discussed a little bit later. But right now, Mike had someone he wanted to see there and do an interview with, and we swapped back and forth. He would hold the mic, and I would hold the camera, and then we'd switch out. So this was Mike's turn to hold the mic. Mike's on the <laughs> mic. We're here at the QRP Labs booth at the Hamvention. 
and I'm with Hans. I'm not even sure, Hans, your call sign is G0. I have a UK call sign Golf Zero UPL and also an American call sign AF7BF, Alpha Foxtrot 7 Bravo Foxtrot. Very good. Now, of course, many uh, viewers will probably recognize Hans from uh, all the various uh, QRP Lab kits that he's produced over the years. I'm not even sure how to refer to you. Chief engineer, chief designer, owner, operator? I'm owner, operator, but also, yeah, designer, software, R&D, production, procurement, everything. <laughs> Very good. One man army. I believe you have a new kit for digital hams. It was, um, it's not just for digital hams, it's for it, all modes. So this was, we've had the digital kit out for the last two years or so which is a five-band digital transceiver, very high performance, built-in 24-bit USB sound card, built-in virtual COM port for CAT control, and that's called QDX, and that's been available the last couple of years. And then before that, we had the uh, QCX Mini, which is a CW-only transceiver, one-band, CW-only, and it's an all-analog transceiver. So the new transceiver, the QMX, is here, and, and is a combination of those two. So it's got the kind of mechanical design of a QCX Mini. The enclosure is the same as a QCX Mini, the way the boards fit together. And in the internal, the electronics are more like a QDX with an embedded SDR. So that's going to be um, initially an 80 to 20 meter, five band, 80, 60, 40, 30, 20 meter. In the next month or so, we'll also have a 20 to 10 meter version, a higher band version. You can do your own bands selection if you want to play with the filter component values. And that will do everything that QCX Mini does and everything that QDX does. And we'll also, it also has a built-in microphone and you can pl plug in a microphone and PTT. So it's going to be an all-mode rig in the end. Wow, very good. I'm just wondering, uh, what, what digital modes does it support natively? At the moment, it supports the same as QDX, which is any FSK-based digital mode. So everything in WSJTX. Um, FSK based modes like FT8, JS8, Whisper, all of those modes. At the moment it does not do modes which require concurrent tones like WinLink or PSK31 which require an SSB transceiver. But once I do the firmware update that will handle SSB, it will also do those modes as well. So then it would literally be all modes, all DG modes, FM, AM, SSB, everything you want will be handled. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Now, I, I came to the booth today looking for uh, the, uh, I guess, the new version of the um, uh, um, Prog Rock. And uh, I guess it's a little different from the, from the first version where it's all programmable in advance. And just for the viewers, uh, in case they don't know, that's a crystal replacement. As you know, quartz crystals are becoming the way of the dodo bird and harder and harder to find. So. This is certainly uh, an option for anybody that needs to get a crystal replaced. Yeah, this was um, a product I had called Progwok for a while, and this is a new version of it. So it's very, very tiny. It actually fits inside an HC6 crystal case. So you know the old metal case, a, a bit bigger than the crystals you see today, but it is really, really tiny. Um, and you, this has got an onboard micro USB port, so you connect a terminal emulator to it and configure what frequencies you want it to operate on. Um, and it just outputs those frequencies, so you don't have to do any configuration with a microcontroller. Um, so it stores its configuration and it's ready next time you power it up. You can also connect a GPS one pulse per second to it and turn it into a GP GPS disciplined oscillator. And it has a resolution of less than one part per billion or something. It, it's a crazy low. So if you had it on 10 megahertz, it would be accurate to better than one millihertz. How's, how's it? Uh, I know with the uh, the version one, right? We use it su successfully in a repeater for right. the replacement. And I know a lot of these repeaters are are, are subject or are sensitive to phase noise, and um, that hasn't been a problem with a with a version one, and certainly it wouldn't be a problem with a version two either. I mean, it's the same. It's basically the same SI five three five one A synthesizer chip. So whatever you had before, if it worked, it will work now. It's just a different and better way of configuring it. So basically you have an onboard microcontroller that configures it and stores the configuration um, and is when you, when you power up, so it's, it's ready. But it's the same technology, uh, PLL technology. Very good. Any, anything else, finally, that... Uh... Yeah, just to say the price on those new Progox, same as the last one, so it's $18, which is less than it would cost you for a custom crystal. And it actually provides three outputs simultaneously, or two if you use the GPS discipline. 
and eight banks of frequencies so you can select the different frequencies. It's a niche item for homebrewers, people who want to do their own design. The QMX um, is, we didn't talk about that, it's all, uh, SMD is already on these boards and that breaks apart into five boards that you just install the through hole components. So it's just through hole components you have to do and a very low price, um, $115 including the case. And so we're also going to do it assembled with a, with a fee. One of the key features of the QMX is also the low receive current. So I use switching regulators, so that buck converters, uh, so that I have a very low receive current. And buck converters can be noisy. I mean, those switch mode power supplies can be noisy. So what I did with these regulators was um, designed a discrete component regulator where the microcontroller is the control loop for the regulator. So it generates a pulse width modulation frequency that switches the, uh, the, the buck converter switch. And it has the ADC input to the microcontroller to feed back what the voltage is so it can adjust for the desired voltage. But it, the microcontroller knows the PWM frequency and it knows the operating frequency. So it can actually adjust the switching frequency of the, micro, of, of the uh, buck converter so that the harmonics are away from the operating frequency. So there's no noise on the, on the reception. That is very clever, and it solves many things with one, one solution. So. so the receive current comes to about 80 milliamps, which is about half what the QDX had. So it's a nice low receive current. Yeah, that's that's uh, very very nice. Uh, well, thank you very much for talking with us today. Thank you. It's, it's been a very nice time bench and very busy. We came with 400 kits, and I think we have less than 100 left. So it's. Uh, yeah, usually that's that's the thing about a ham bench. And you, if you see something, you you need to buy it right away before you find out it's no longer available. Right, that's right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. I picked up two prog rocks. Oops, you can't see; they're invisible. <laughs> okay, like there they are. <laughs> oh, I got two too. Yeah, me. I brought them, <laughs> bought them as well. <laughs> Mine are like really cheap. Yeah, <laughs> but. You know, considering it's got a US uh, micro, or uh, sorry, it's a mini USB connector on it, it's the, the whole board is about the size of a postage stamp. Yeah. And uh, considering it has three separate outputs on it, it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, that would be unheard of, being able to do something like that. I remember I had the, um, well, some of the, some of the older uh, veteran hams out there may remember the old... Uh, glb channelizers and it was like one of the first things that you could use to synth synthesize a um a crystal controlled radio and it was in a cabinet probably like that big but that tall and had uh three knobs on the top three knobs on the bottom so your top three were for your transmit and the bottom three was receiver i might have that backwards but anyway um it's amazing that uh, you know the the little device size of a post stamp can can do what it did and and more and it's programmable. You just uh, just need a terminal and hook it up to the USB and uh, program the frequency you want in it. It was really yes. cool hearing them talk about the uh, firmware update for that other one that that'll allow the dual tone modes. Oh. That's I yeah. Didn't know I, that I, was I I couldn't watch you at the same time, but when he mentioned WinLink. I, I bet you I could have saw your ears perk up if you weren't wearing that headset. Absolutely. Speaking of things about that tall. They don't say this every day. <laughs> so is that an Armstrong rotator on that tower? Oh, yeah. Actually, it's a Nextron. <laughs> it's what I call a Nextron rotator. I've had this thing now for 25 years. It's a 25th year. Yeah, it's Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We pretty much started at the same time. Sure did. And uh, uh, that's how I got to know Sam, because every time we cross paths, everybody wanted to take pictures. Of course it is. It's cool here. Yes. Oh, and it's a crank up. And Sam has Well, been it's got problems cranking up right now. It's like I said, it's 25 years old. It's starting to show its age, but I'm, I'm going to have to do some major repairs. To it. I can't even get the lights to work now, so. Uh, what is that? It's not my first one. This is my second one. 0.25? <laughs> this is. 
But I enjoy it. I mean, come out here and we, we both have a great time while we're here. And we spend a little bit of money. And this is how we met each other. We've yeah, been right. great friends ever since. That's right. True. <laughs> Interesting. I met Joe out in yeah. the uh, flea market area. Who got one of those? This really neat little screwdriver with this call sign on it. Nice. I think that's a little. Uh, oh, that's a CQ. I guess he's he's done some uh, articles for CQ magazine. Yeah, he's done a bunch of them. Yeah, he does. Thanks, everything. Joe. It was really cool meeting you. I think I run into Joe. Of course, he's not hard to miss. A Hamvention, but I've been seeing him at Hamvention. I was asking him how long he's been going to Hamvention. I think he mentioned early 70s, yeah. and that's like certainly way before my time. But was the girl with the tower hair there? I didn't see her this year. I didn't see her either. She, um, may, she may have been, but... She's always there. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the first time I've noticed a guy with the beam on his head. Yeah, I've never seen him. Yeah. That's I saw, what we me. saw another guy with a, a hard hat, and it had a... Um, a multi-element Yagi. I think it was a 70-centimeter Yagi yeah. uh, just mounted at the top of the hard hat. Um, I think that was about it. I, I was mentioning years past, there used to be two guys that wore these uh, two-meter cubicle quads on top of hard hats, and uh, apparently they were functional. Cool. And, uh, of course, they had to be facing each other in order to talk to each other. <laughs> well, you know, I really like the microcontroller projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we all do. Yeah, but I found someone here who's uh, done something pretty cool with it. I met Barry Bulow, W Zero I Y, from the Cedar Rapids Radio Farm Group. He's got something here that's a neat little project that he's offering now. And by the way, all these guys here are mostly ex Collins employees. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Barry and let him tell us what he's been up to here. So uh, we're here in Windy Zeno, Ohio. You're going to hear the wind blowing the canopy here. Uh, this is a, a project that we started at home. It's a four to one remote antenna switch. And you put 12 volts DC in through this bias T and power comes up the coax and then goes into the board here. There's a CPU board plugged in and there's four relays. And so this is four to one switch with, power, with remote power and then you control it on Wi-Fi. It's 2.4 gig Wi-Fi. You can talk to it directly or you can uh, run it through your LAN. And then here's an example of the interface. There's a web server running on an ESP32. And so this is the this is an interface. This is for the Matrix, which is another product. And uh, you just select an antenna and it goes there. And this is like life size. It's about a four by four inch uh, uh, Wi-Fi to uh, browser. And uh, that's all there is to it. And down here we have uh, a f two radio to six antenna Matrix. So from radio to radio, there's 70 dB of isolation on 20 meters. This will take full power, full 1500 watts, and it's good through six meters. And this interface, this is for the matrix, and you can select an antenna and it goes there. If you select the same antenna that's already taken, you get nothing. So you can't you can't steal that guy's antenna. You can pick another one, but you can't pick the same one. You, you can also lock it, so you can't change it, and the other guy can't change it. So we tried to think of a lot of things to uh, uh, put protection into it, and uh, paid a lot of attention to the impedances. Got a fancy four-layer circuit board, and uh, hope it uh, helps people out. So what, what wattage will it handle? It'll handle full kilowatt. It'll take the full 1,500 watts. Okay. Yeah. It's an eight, it's an eight project there. What, what are the prices of these things, and how can people learn more about it? Okay, so this is $200 for a kit. The surface mount is all done. you got to put in relays and a bunch of number four screws, 
and the most time you're going to spend is on your hands and knees looking for that last screw that you dropped on the floor. And our website is team, T-E-A-M dash, X-C-R dot com. And there's all kinds of information in there about the switch, and uh, there's instructions, links to the instructions, and uh, it's really not too difficult. It's a one evening project to do this. And the matrix is 400 for the kit, 450 assembled. And you get all the parts, you get everything you need. There's no extra little pieces to buy or anything. Well, thanks for telling us about this, Barry. This is, this is a project right up my alley here. I like playing with these kind of things and to see someone take it and actually make a product out of it. That's great. And, and the price is uh, real reasonable, too. It's cheaper than four uh, hundred feet runs of uh, LMR four hundred. Certainly. <laughs> yes. All right. Thanks for talking with us. Thank you, George. That's pretty cool. Wow, very cool. That was. Yeah, I like that. And they had a tent out in the flea market. That was Team XCR. That's X Collins Radio employees. Ah, nice. They were from Cedar Rapids, and there was a guy there from originally from Mississippi. And I started a conversation with him, and he comes back in the state every so often. Uh, but he worked for Collins. And uh, so I got started on a, in a conversation with him. We talked a long time, and Barry was standing right there next door, or, or right next to him. And that's when I saw what he had there. And Oh, yeah. Uh, you know we take hurricane season very seriously down here. I know you all do, too, a little bit further north than us, but... Uh, if something's coming this way, it's going to get us. And there was uh, KG5 CEN, Glenn, who's in the chat room tonight, uh, had a visit with the uh, Hurricane Hunters. This is the Hurricane Hunters banner in the uh, one of the uh, aircraft. And they greet you when you come into one of them. And this was held at the Lakefront Airport here in New Orleans. That's the uh, million-dollar road terminal there at the airport. Of course, there were several vendors there. There's some NASA was there, and of course, NOAA was there, giving people information and demonstrations of things. And they also had several of their aircraft. This one here is uh, one of them. Obviously, some specialized things going on there. And the Coast Guard had a little display of, uh, looks like some of their uh, rescue boats, maybe for local here. And there's their uh, big one that they fly right into the heart of the storms. And as Glenn put it in some video that he has of this, this is the important parts, the parachutes. And I'm not sure I'd want to be jumping out of this during a hurricane, but I guess if they have to, they have to. I hope they got some major floaties with those parachutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's another shot of the uh, cockpit of that big one and a full shot of the other one. It was an interesting part of that aircraft. I'm wondering if it's radar or weather radar or something on the tail. Yeah. The, the extension on the tail there. Yeah. Don't know exactly what it is. I know they have descriptions of these aircraft on their uh, site, the Hurricane Hunters uh, NOAA site, but uh, definitely specialized things in these aircraft, no doubt. Can you imagine being in that thing going into that storm? No. No. <laughs> That would, that would be uh, quite a bumpy ride. Yeah. Uh, so I thanks, thanks, Glenn, for going there. And yeah, we're getting ready. June, June, we're getting ready to start the season down here. And uh, he's already uh, visited the conference, the Hurricane Conference, and met up with all of the uh, people from the um, Miami Hurricane Center and NHC and uh had their conference and there was a forum a specific forum there which we probably talk about a little bit later specifically for ham radio so they're really into it they like what we do and we keep in touch with them hmm. tis the season i got a little piece of video you sent along too emil yep this is uh the uh description of what they use that aircraft for 
So this is our drop song. This is the weather instrument. We drop into the hurricane. It uh, gathers data such as wind speed, direction, temperature, relative humidity, and pressure. We put it in the launch tube here. It launches out the bottom of the aircraft. This is what it looks like as it falls. It gets a little dead shoot on the inside. And then once it gathers all that data, it's actually sending it back to us on this computer. I saw a documentary on TV about that one time. Looks like the same stuff. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thanks to Glenn. Shout out. He's in I think thanks, he's in a Glenn. chat room still tonight. Yeah, I appreciate cool. that, Glenn. Very cool. So who uh who else did you see at uh convention of the usual gang that we usually run into? Well I saw our friend Emmett. Oh, yeah? yeah. Cool. Yeah, he's he's always a character to talk to. I, I like him. He is and he's always got some kind of new antenna idea. Oh. This one, Tommy. This one's got your name written all oh, over it. Oh, does it? The yeah. M5ZNO antenna? Uh, that's what he should call it. He should. I'm with him at Hansi at Radio Waves. We always stop in, say hello, and see what's new. And there's always something new. Hi, Emmett. How you doing, George? It's great to see you again, man. You're looking great and fit and schwell, as they used to say in some other parts of the world. Well, they didn't know what they were talking about, apparently. <laughs> yeah. How's the uh, invention been so far? It's just started, I know. Well, for a Friday, I think we've got some really good traffic. Um, it's kind of crowded at times, which is e excellent. It's reminding me of what it used to be back in the day when we were at Hare Arena, when we'd have these huge groups of people come through. So I, I think we're seeing a good, you know, a good crowd of people. Yeah, I think for Friday, it's been very yeah. crowded. Yeah, because normally on, on this is a Saturday kind of crowd, so it's... Um, like I said, for Friday, I think we've got some good numbers in here. Well, you've got a new antenna here. It's the first thing I saw when I walked in. And I know this is going to check all the boxes for Tommy. So why don't you tell us about it? All right. And this is for you, Tommy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, basically, what we've done is we've come up with a new, not really a new antenna. I've been playing with this design for almost 20 years. I just never got around to, you know, actually building one. But what this is is our the, the, the Radio Waves Voyager antenna series. And uh, we have the Voyager 1, 2, and 3 in memoration of uh, our Voyager satellites, of course. But the other thing is you can really get out and touch, touch people with it. What this is is a vertical off-center fed dipole. And what this allows you to do is work, for instance, this configuration that we've got right now goes on an MFJ 1910 and we're using an ICOM ACH4 autocoupler at the bottom but with this off center fed configuration we're able to do 80 meters through 10 uh, contiguous which is absolutely wonderful and great performance it's super light it's easy to set up and uh, you get great DX from it one of the things that we did a while back ago um, last fall as a test for uh, an agency that was wanting to play with something. Uh, we had to do an emergency communications uh, link test where we had to go through 18 counties in Iowa in 24 hours, make contact with a single point, as in not just anybody, a single point in Italy. And uh, so what we literally did is on 40 meters, over 24 hours, we did 18 counties. We would completely set up a, a station make the contact with our, our with our person in Italy, tear down, and then move to the next next county. And uh, what that required was the simplicity of being able to set up, tear down, operate, and then move on to the next location. Uh, which, as, as most people will know, it's not, an, it's not a simple task. But what this did is it gave us the ability to quickly, you know, set up and tear down and um, have consistency between point A and point B when we set up at the new location. And because it's a vertical antenna, it's great for, you know, it's, it has a low takeoff angle of radiation, so that means uh, definitely good for the DX. And then um, it also is, you know, it, it's not as susceptible to, to noise, like power line noise and a lot of the EM type problems that we have within, with uh, antenna systems. I guess it's folded a lot of times to be able to get the whole length on the pole in this situation we've got the antenna set up to where on for instance on the 1910 which is a 33 foot fiberglass pole if you were to extend this all the way out it would go all the way up to 33 feet and then 
we've created a, a like it's a, a ladder line type configuration where we bring the the ground plane up up to this little diamond up here and then it comes back down and that's how you get your off center fed and you don't need a ground you don't need a you know a counterpoise i should say because of that cool because it is like a dipole it's like a dipole but it's off center fed so it's uh, it's not resonant on any one frequency, and that's the idea. So it's just short on 40 meters, so it brings in everything else, and we don't have to deal with the harmonics and all that because that's why we're using the autocouplers or like, um, like, you know, like these little portable QRP type tuners that you can just hook it up to the hook it up to the wires, and, and you're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Do a Star Wars kind of thing. And of course, it, it will work with Tommy's. Uh, I, I came AH705, is yes, that what it, it is? Yes, it will. It's AH705. As a matter of fact, um, with a, we have another antenna product called the, the 705, which you which you featured. And um, that got us going with the, with the AH705. Uh, this will work perfectly because it's all set up to connect right to the AH705 and work, you know, the, the different frequencies of the AH705. So it's it's perfect for QRP. We've got a lot of people who've done um, uh, Yoda, um, Soda, and Parks on the Air activations with it. Well, Emmett, I appreciate you talking to us and showing us your latest creation here. There's people in line waiting on you, so I'm going to let you go. Right. But uh, great to catch up with you again. Thank you, George. It's great seeing you as you as always. Are we going to see you in Huntsville? Uh, you will. All right. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Seven three. Thank you. Seven threes. And Emmett's got some of the most interesting antennas. Mm -hmm. You'll see. He takes ideas that we've heard of before, and like this case, he rotated it 90 degrees. Yeah. That's the first vertical I've ever heard of that doesn't require ground radials. Yeah. It's amazing. That's very cool. Yeah, yes. He's a sharp guy. Off center fed. Yeah. His antennas, Although, are, they're really well, really I, strong. Yeah. It's it's not uh, it's not wire you get at Lowe's. It's some very good yeah. cable. It doesn't knot up bad like very uh, cool. a lot of other stuff does. We saw a lot of friends there. Uh Mike and I did and visited with a lot of them. We found uh, a lot of chairs sitting around outside and just kind of made us a little circle and all sat out there and got sunburned real bad. Yeah, that's a good time right yeah. there. I'm, I'm still peeing One, one fellow that uh, I didn't mention before, um, but he actually spotted me, was uh, Jocelyn. Uh, uh, let's see if I can get his call right. KDX VRX, or KD8 VRX, I believe is his call. Is that is that right? I believe that's right. Yeah, I think so. I anyway, saw... he was he was he was hopping around between I think three different booths. Yeah, uh, taking the rounds and uh, doing his thing. So, I, but uh, he was about the last person that I saw there. I was leaving. I was trying to find where I parked the car, <laughs> and I had walked all the way around the outside, <laughs> every little street leading in and out. And it was the last place that I hadn't looked, but I ran across Jocelyn then. If I had been able to walk straight to the car, I would have missed him. Oh. But, uh, yeah, I got to visit with him a few cool. minutes. Of course, I saw Chris several times while we were yeah. there. I also saw this guy right here. You, you may have heard of him before. Ran into Jeff, K8JTK again, one of our uh, Link Meisters that... Still, well, today it's the logic net that we have uh, one, second Tuesday roughly every month. Except for maybe this month, because I think the second Tuesday already passed. Yeah. Well, Hamvention's always a special case. Of, uh, wrenching of things, yeah. So how things been? Very good. Hit the flea market yesterday and uh, walked through all that since it's going to be a nice day. No rain or anything, so I got through that, and then today I'm going to hit most of the inside stuff. So how have things been going with your, um, and I, I always get the term wrong, but multi-mode linking system? I, I call it the DVMIS, Digital VoIP Multi-Mode Interlink System. Uh, going pretty well. Uh, it's, uh, I'm testing out some software with the All-Star guys, so that's pretty cool. And uh, 
you know, finding some bugs and things like that and hopefully making the All-Star project better. But other than that, everything seems to be running just great. And Jeff's website is a good resource. If you're trying to do uh, any type of uh, digital mode linking, uh, maybe using uh, some software that uses the Ambi Kodak or various different things, sometimes things don't go as smoothly as you'd like. This guy has done a lot of the work and figured it out and posted it out there where you can grab it. Where is that? Uh, my website is uh, k8jtk.org, and it's also linked up on my QRZ page, so if you find my call sign, everything is always linked up there. And uh, every month I write an article for the Ohio Section Journal, and usually something technical or, you know, SDRs, things like that. So you can uh, subscribe to that, too, if you want to read my ramblings every month from the Section Journal. Cool. Well, Jeff, thanks for everything you do. Great to catch up with you again nice this year. you guys. I enjoyed running into you guys and uh, helping you out here at the Icon booth. Thanks again. Seven threes. Seven three. And look, he's wearing the colors, too. I am. As a matter of fact, everybody's representing here but Mike. He's got but, a but shirt on. He, he may. Oh, he's oh, got the amateur He's got a T-shirt. Ah. Yeah, okay. Okay, my bad. <laughs> he's got it. Mike, I was <laughs> calling you out there, but uh, you had it covered up. I, I did. I had another sh shirt on top. Um, so it wasn't obviously that visible <laughs> it was kind of cool that morning saturday morning nice. was a little chilly nice yeah it's cool. it was it was perfect weather like i i kept saying this over and over again that the law of averages has to play out one of these years where it doesn't rain on the invention weekend hmm. and uh this is about as close as i've ever seen it in a long time anyway well you you write about that jeff uh, his website, George, he definitely takes the uh, work out of it and oh, puts yeah. some, he works some things out, man. Yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm telling you. You have to, you have to view one of his presentations because he's got this chart. It's it's more like a flow chart that has everything mapped out, how everything's all interconnected. And uh, there's, there's really a lot of uh, nuts and bolts and a lot of things going on there. Yeah. And it was, uh, was really great to, to spend some time with Jeffrey and of course Chip, and uh, it never seems to be a long enough time. That that uh, circle of chairs you mentioned, I think, would <laughs> left cousin Jerry talking to Chip. And when we came back, I don't know how long we were gone, George. We had to go to the uh, the Tapper booth, and yeah. when we came back, it looks like they were still in the same engaged <laughs> in the same conversation when we left. Must yeah. have been a good one. You could probably tell the. Uh Based on where they were burned, oh. you could tell. You could <laughs> yeah, tell where the many, sun was. How long that was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tommy, speaking of boats. Yeah, <laughs> or former boats. <laughs> former boats, yes. Yeah. Um, so I got a, I didn't have an email I wanted to read this time, but I, I found an article that I thought was really cool. I'm not going to read the whole thing because we've still got some video to show, and the show's running kind of long, but. I think I ran into the link on this on QRZ, maybe. But anyway, it's about uh, the Titanic, about the amateur radio operator, one of the first people to hear the SOS call from uh, from the Titanic. Um, the guy's name was uh, Artie Moore. Um, anyway, it's a very interesting article. He went on to do some work with the 3D modeling where they did the... Uh, model of the titanic on the ocean floor and stuff it's very cool uh the link will be in the show notes and uh, anyway i think you ought to go check it out if you're interested in that stuff at all but it's very cool it's from the bbc yeah cool. so he was in wales yeah cool yeah very, it's very interesting and if you're interested in a think pad there's a link you can yeah. click on the top yeah, there. The, BB, <laughs> the BBC got really slick because you can't hide those ads at all. There's no X or anything, and they don't yeah. scroll off. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know what the last words of uh, Captain Smith when the Titanic was sinking were? The last the last words from his... From what were they? afraid to ask. Where, where's all this water coming from? <laughs> Okay. Um, oh, my <laughs> goodness. Check, please. 
There was a new product there, another new product. Oh, uh, yeah? There were a lot of new products. There were a lot of new and products. And I'm sure I missed the majority of them, but the really cool ones, they just kind of, they kind of directed themselves toward me. We're talking with Jim, K-I-6-Z-U-M, the creator of the Zoom Spot, who has a new product available now. Looks pretty neat. Ham Radio Outlet asked Zoom Radio, or they commissioned us to create these smart uh, cat CIV screens for Yesu and ICOM radios. Um, these are based on a commercially available screen called the M5 Stack, which is an educational unit. And uh, all of the software has been written to support both the ICOM and the Yesu radios in the same unit. And currently we have it, this one set up Bluetooth connected to a external Bluetooth adapter that we also made for HRO. And it gives the, the 710 a connection so that as you tune the frequency on the radio, you're getting the same frequency updates on the screen. It also has some other information about modes and filters. And it also lets you view on the little VU meter a different mode if you wanted to. For example, one might be SDWR and one might be power or ID. The ICOM one here is paired to a 705, which has built-in Bluetooth capability. And so a Bluetooth adapter like the one on the 710 isn't needed. We do already have support for ICOM's 7100, 7300, 9100, 9100, 7610, and a couple of others. As we get time and as we get access to them to test, we'll be adding new radios and new features. Um, the units come with a power supply. They're assembled with the stand. They also come with a programming cable, so it makes it easier for users to update when the new releases come out. And the ICOM screens in the next update will have both the single meter as a needle meter and will have an, a secondary mode of all of, the, all of the data in a bar graph mode. For the Yesu, the next release, will have uh, bar graph meters that look more like they do on the 710 and less like the ones that they run on like the, the other Yesu radios, allowing the user to pick one or the other. If you like a 710 bar meter more than a VU meter with a needle, you can choose that. These are just powered by USB-C. It comes with a regular 5-volt power adapter. In fact, it's the same make and model power adapter that we ship with the ZoomSpot Elite unit. They're all communicating Bluetooth and the same SPP, which is serial over, over wireless communication. The show HRO has priced these at 149 The Bluetooth adapter cables, I pushed very hard to have them made available as an as a affordable price. So for all the radios except for the DX10, their sale price is $30. And the DX10, because it requires some additional electronics, is uh, 35 I believe. That looks pretty cool, doesn't it? Yeah, it yeah. does. I'm really amazed at how clear those little tiny... I'm, I'm guessing they must be OLED displays. Yeah, I've got one of those M5 stacks ordered to be here Saturday. i got... Uh, That's we'll tomorrow. Probably... Yeah, I won't be here, though. It'll, it'll be sitting there waiting on me when I get back. Okay, I'll run by your mailbox and pick okay. it up for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Neat. So, yeah, so stay tuned. There'll be some more stuff similar to that coming up here very soon. Mm -hmm. Well, I had an email here recently from a guy that uh, writes us ever so often with uh, topical information. Cool. And i got to tell you, this one right here, Tommy brought a tear to my eye. Did it? It did. <laughs> Must have been a good one then. He said, uh, George, Tommy, while I had the time, I was doing a massive cleanup and discovered a Christmas present from December 1969. I was in the 10th grade and wanted a VOM for Christmas, and Santa answered the promise. After being stored for about 30 years, I opened it up. Yes, the batteries did leak, although the damage was not that great. One pin light battery required and one 15 volt battery. Hmm, 15 volt. Hmm. I had to order, oh, excuse me, I had to solder the batteries in 
and used a 12 volt battery instead of the required 15 volt battery. Clean some contacts and the meter is as good as it was on that Christmas morning. Can't tell you all the use I got of it. I can't tell you all the use I got out of it. And now maybe some more years ahead. And this is a photo he sent me here. And I I believe the meter he is talking about is the one on the bottom there. Yeah. And I'm not familiar with that particular meter. I, do you recall that one, Mike? Um, the one on the <laughs> right? I, I, the reason I'm kind of laughing is because I'm looking at the picture and it, it's actually... Um, turned around so yeah. the meters are on the top the teslas are on the bottom so i'm i'm assuming you're meaning the one on the right the smaller one yes the one on the right i think is the one he's talking about because the other one is a range doubler which i am familiar with and i don't think right. it had a 15 volt battery yeah i i don't recall that other model especially with the curved top yeah i've never seen one like that before so it's cool looking very yeah. cool Nice yeah. size too. Yeah, yeah. I imagine that was pretty pretty cool find though to find something like you've had like oh, yeah. that for so long and still works. He got me thinking about my first meter, and I know I don't have it anymore. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, the one on the left though is the Radio Shack Range Doubler or my Kranta Range Doubler meter. And when I was working at the Radio Shack store, we sold a lot of those. Mm -hmm. It's basically just a, a multimeter, but it had a switch for times two that you could flip in, and all the ranges would be double whatever they had on them. I imagine you're familiar with that one now, Mike. Yeah, I remember uh, they were in the store when I was working there, um, and then they went to the uh, the ones with the FET input for the high for the high impedance. Mm -hmm. But uh, I noticed I was trying to read that. Um, other smaller meter, but it appears to be a Micronta as well. If it you look is. at the meter movement itself. It, it is. And but, here's uh, another one. This is the one you were talking about, the FETV. Oh, yeah. One. Yeah, there you go. These, I believe, sold for about 50 bucks. I had one of these. About uh, similar size to a Simpson 260. It had a mirrored scale on it. Mm -hmm. A very nice meter for the price. Not as rugged as a Simpson but it did have that FET input on it, so it had a high impedance, which was perfect because you could measure stuff that you can't measure with something like a Simpson or a regular old analog meter. Well, check out those one kilovolt uh, inputs uh, oh, yeah. on the side there. I had um, one you can of, do a lot with that meter. I had one of these for years and years and uh, repaired it after several accidents. But finally, what got it is I knocked it off the table, and it uh, it broke the movement in it. They don't so. bounce. They don't bounce. No, they don't. They don't uh, take a lot of. Uh, in fact, you notice a lot of the meters even today, they generally come with one of those uh, rubber bumper type mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. uh, that you can take off the meter itself, and uh, that that certainly saves them from a lot of accidental drops i think they're good to about six feet you can yeah. drop them in one final video tonight this is part two of my visit with ray and looking at some other stuff that icom had there one thing in particular that i think is going to appear here on the table and we need to get to your son and whoever else we can that night because ray does not need to leave here Oh. <laughs> with with this box. He needs to leave it here when he goes. But let's take a look at this. We had already seen last year the SHF project, but it was still kind of new. We didn't know exactly everything it was going to do. So it's out there. I've seen, well, I've talked to people who have bought them here at the show. I don't think there's any more left. I think everything's been bought up today, but so that's, that's There's two. more coming. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's really two new products. Really, you kind of say in introducing this one because now we know exactly what it is and what it does. Well, and two, then, two things that we've learned here from my buddy Scott over there that's on his phone. Oh, he's trying to take a photo. Is he was sharing with us, he's, he does transverters. Yeah. 
And he, he the 2.4 gig, he says, with his transverter is very limited because he uses the two meter as his IF. As you know, we only have eight meg in two meters. So his transverter can only do two of the, how many meg wide is 2.4? 70. 70 meg wide and you could only use eight meg. The, the 905 covers the entire 2.4. Well, I saw Scott's talk last night and now I have a, a better appreciation for what you could do with this radio. And one of the other things, it's, it's created the, the frequency coordination body to really scratch their head because they're, they're used to CW, sideband, and a couple of other modes up in those bands. Well, this radio introduces FM. Huh. So now they're like, uh, where do we put the FMers in, in this band plan? Well, you got plenty of band up there. Yes. And also one of the other things, when he came to Orlando, he's like, do we have specs on the 10 gig? And it covers the entire 10 gig because it uses the 2.4 gig as the IF. So there again, you don't have to worry about a transverter that has a sliver because of the IF you're using, you get the whole spectrum. But the third item that I mentioned was the PW2. You now can touch and drool on it. We're being told that if everything goes as planned, it should be this fall. Well, I'll look forward to that. We saw this last year, but... But you couldn't do this with it. You yeah. couldn't touch it. You couldn't, couldn't change your antennas. And now with the antenna, you can even select so you've got a GUI for what antenna that you've got. So you want to do a, a wire? So it makes it easy so you can switch antennas and everything touchscreen, which side that you want, what band. It's got the internal antenna tuner, power supply, all in this size box. And George, if you, if you don't quite have the antennas yet, you can drop it down to 500 watts. Yeah, but you really wouldn't want to do that unless you had to. Well, no, there are cases where you would only want 500 watts, but... Um, yeah, but depending on your wire and your ballon, you might not want to be sending the smoke signals. And I don't know, no manual. There's an SD card. Hmm. Exactly. There's a lot of hmm. A LAN connector. Right now, no manual, no description, undefined. Well, this uh, brings up some interesting possibilities. This might make a nice remote station amplifier, huh? Awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things that you can consider and and dream of and wish and think about what are they going what what's the purpose of it? And right now we don't know. Now you got your receive antenna in and out. I, I'd heard from a ham yesterday that said he'd bought another one that just had antennas in. But in this, with the in and out, you can add filtering and switch in other filtering. They have marketed this as an SO2R amplifier. So all your filtering, your, your switches, bandpass filters, and all that will be controlled through here or from the radios. Like the, okay. like the 5100, the magnetic for the head. I'm excited to see what all we can do with this when we finally get a production unit. Well, that is great. We, you know, we've been drooling over that about a year now, I guess. So, um. Well, a little bit longer than that. We showed it at the Tokyo Ham Fair. I think it was 2019 was the last one. Then COVID, the engineers couldn't work together. So the, the whole remote working, everything, that, that concept had to be dealt with. And now struggling for components. And I would almost bet we've had to do some re-engineering of the other design to put new components in. But there again, all of that speculation, that's on my behalf. And this one is full power, full duty cycle as well. Yes. Yeah, that's, so, that's the way they spec it. So you can crank down on a thousand watts and just hang there as long as you want. Yes, sir. I mean, I had friends that disputed the PW1's claims of 100% duty cycle, but after a couple of RTTY contests, they're like, it ran smoothly, had no issues with it. Well, it's good to see you again, Ray. We don't catch it, well, I don't know, 
two, three times a year. Uh, you bet Huntsville this year? Oh, definitely. Now, one question for you. If I find one of these in my trunk, can, can you handle it? I can handle it. All right. So uh, we, we won't melt any antennas? No. Mm -mm. I've got a, well, I've got an 80-meter loop, so it's good for, for whatever we want. And uh, a 1.5 kW ballon on my off-center fed dipole. So, yeah, we should be good. And I don't know we can do a full duty cycle for like 24 hours, but I don't think we'll melt anything. All right, then maybe we make a few contacts from your QTH with it. Cool. Looking forward to it, Ray. And I'll bring back up because I know that it'll be tough to get this thing out of that shack. Yeah, well, maybe we can get Tommy to come over, too. <laughs> yeah, he would be on your side, though, not mine. Oh. oh, that's right. That's right. Oh, so this is going to be a smackdown, huh? I don't know. Could be. See, when we do this with the with the uh, ID uh, 50, and I guess I don't know what we're going to smack down against, the 51 or the 52 on that one. Maybe both. That might have to be a, a three-way match. Eh, you, you never know, but you see, George is almost at a loss of words, isn't he, Mike? He's struggling there. That's a, a lot to think about, you know, in a short amount of time. All right. Well, George, thank you for stopping by. It's As always, it's fun to talk to you and, and the folks that follow you. Mike, great to see you as well. Thank you, Ray. We'll look forward to seeing you in Huntsville. All righty. We'll see you all there. I'd like to have that trunk. I don't I don't want the amp. I want the trunk he uh, finds all that stuff in. Oh, I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know, know, George and Tommy. That, that amp might be way too heavy to carry out. They might have to stay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm working on an idea for a giant electromagnet we'll mount up under the table here. <laughs> and when he sits it down, I'll th I'll throw the. He won't be out. able to pick it up. Yeah, <laughs> he'll have to drag the desk out with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a very nice looking amplifier. Hundred percent duty cycle. That's just that's pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, broadcast Spe gear, especially for solid state. Yeah. That's uh, that's pretty good. Broadcast gear is, you know, 100% duty cycle. I've got a 50 kilowatt solid state <laughs> transmitter that's been running in the swamp for years, mm -hmm. but uh, not amateur stuff. No, right. it's, it's not made to to take that kind of punishment. But this box is. So that's. Is cool. it guaranteed not to cause blackouts in your neighborhood <laughs> uh, on Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah, not. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not necessarily near the Superdome. <laughs> well, guys, I think that's it. I believe that's everything we had here video-wise. Oh, we've been going a little while. It was a long show tonight. But that was some good coverage, though. Yeah. I uh, appreciate you guys doing all that. Well, hey, we missed it, but I feel like I at least got to experience some of it. You did. Some of it, as much as I did, because we shot just about everything. And I'm with George. There is stuff I found out I missed after the fact. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, well, there's always Huntsville Ham Fest, and there's always next year. Oh, yeah. Uh, who's coming to Huntsville this year? I'll be at Huntsville unless something terrible happens. That's what I'm playing. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're planning on being there. Um, looking forward to seeing a lot of you there. And looking forward to seeing a lot of you on the next Ham College, which would have been this weekend, but because we had our, our Dayton coverage tonight. It looks like it's probably going to be next Friday. Uh, Ham College may be next Friday. So we'll, we'll post it in all the usual social media locations that uh, you might go to. In all the usual, unusual places. Yep. Speaking of that, I have a new usual place that I don't get to go to very much, a new favorite store. Oh, yeah? Yep. Oh, Micro, Micro Center. Center. I love Micro Center. Where's uh, that at? Sharonville, Ohio, just outside of Cincinnati. I flew in and out of Cincinnati this year. Uh, it was a little cheaper than uh, going through the Dayton Airport. And they had a Micro Center. I looked it up, and I found it, and I said, okay, I'll stop there. And picked up a few things. You know, I used to really like fries. Mm hmm Yeah. Fries was good. They're gone now. But Micro Center, 
I think I like it a little better. For me. My Christmas is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more nerdy stuff or something. Yes. It's, it's actually more up my alley. In my our too. alley, yeah. yeah. They need one you know, down around New Orleans. There yeah, really I, should be one down there. I'll say I'd drive down there for it just for too. that. Yeah. And Manjack yeah. going to Middendorf's. I picked there up you go. a few things while I was there, and it you know you could spend hours just. Browsing and mm -hmm. drooling all over the merchandise. Been there, and done that. I used yeah. to go to the one in Dallas a pretty good bit when I was going over there regularly. Yeah, been to that one, one in Houston, and uh, yeah, if you're passing by a micro center, plan on swinging through there and spending a few minutes or hours. Did you look to see if they had any raspberry pies? They didn't. Yeah, they had some uh, raspberry pie picos, but you know that's all anybody's got right yeah. now. Now, I didn't see, I think I saw one raspberry pie during my whole Hamvention weekend. Really? Hmm. Yep. Might need to start looking for an alternative to that. There's got to be something else out there. Oh, there are. Well, there is, Not, but yeah. I think I think they're running into the same issues with, uh, you know, parts shortages. I mean, there's the orange pie that's still kind of popular, but... Um, it's kind of still hard to beat the Raspberry Pi for user support, you know, like community support, I mean. You mm -hmm. know, I build um, computer systems for radio stations. Been doing that for a lot of years, and Tommy and I started a company doing that years ago. Audio cards have not been a problem to get. And, of course, we only use really high-quality professional audio cards. Right now, I've got five computers sitting over here waiting for audio cards really? because they haven't been able to get the components, so they're going wow. to be another two or three weeks. Sound blasters, man. No, sound they're not, blasters. They're not sound no, blasters. Oh, no, I know they're not. I'm <laughs> yeah. saying you might have to fall back to them. Yeah, might have no, to just fire up Turtle Beach. That was in, in popularity for, uh, what was it, about 20 years ago? They were the thing. Yeah. Um, oh, I forgot about them. Sound, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's going to do it for tonight. It's been a fun show. Appreciate everyone who watched and everyone who's going to watch on the download here. Before we get out of here, though, let's run around and see if anybody's got any last words of wisdom or regret. Either way. No regrets. No regrets? No. Nope. Uh, it was a good show. I enjoyed all this, the, like I said earlier, seeing all the stuff from Dayton. Um, reminder, ham, uh, field day's coming up. It is. So I'm actually starting a little bit of my prep. I think my next segment's going to be a little bit about that. Uh, got a little new little piece of gear. No, not a big deal, but I'm going to kind of get that set up and uh, kind of start getting my field day prep done. Yeah, I guess we need to start trying to untangle this uh, this uh, antenna back here, this cobweb. <laughs> yeah, it might take that long. <laughs> yeah. It took us that long to pack it back up this this past year. But, uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Email. Any thoughts from down there? Absolutely. We're getting ready for field day. I got my Go Box ready to go and the battery. And uh, also getting ready to start watching the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico for hurricane season, getting the swing of that. So lots of things to uh, do down here and prep for uh, – all that june is always a good uh ham radio month but other than that <laughs> keep, oh, it keep it cheap keep it cheap and field day is when tommy june 24th to 25th mike any final thoughts from up there tonight uh I, I've got more things to try to cram in my box of unfilled dreams. <laughs> um, but I did manage to pick up some wire. I always seem to pick up wire from the wire man. Um, this stuff is really nice and thin and uh, very flexible. So it's going to be my my portable antenna. I'm going to make a portable dipole. I've already uh, started 3D printing a winder for it. So um and then what else oh yeah i bought a distribution amplifier for uh it's going to be for time signals for uh for for in my case it's going to be used for uh for 10 meg 
Um, and I'm sure I'm going to get more than one segment out of that because I've got a lot of different projects that are related to time. And uh, other than that, I picked up some uh, liquid solder flux. Um, I didn't know what kind to get, so I bought one of each. Perfect. And, uh, oh, yeah, one, one other little interesting thing. I ran into uh, Puxatani Phil's the groundhog. It must be his manager because I got a pen from him. Home of the Groundhog, Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. The only thing I bought ham radio wise was this Coley Mike cable we talked about earlier. You didn't earlier. even get to the plastic pieces for it. <laughs> no, well, I know. I, I, I was expecting there to be connectors on each end. Well, there will be. I'm going to put them on there. Uh, some of the RJ45s. And <laughs> yeah, pork chop sandwich. Wait, only Maybe one of them, though. Only one pork chop sandwich. Yes, we were not going to try to FedEx those to y'all. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I was looking for it. Yeah. Every, every day I asked my wife if she saw the FedEx guy come by. Are, yeah. are they at Huntsville by any chance? No. Mm -mm. I guess it's, it's different there entirely. Only, only in Xenia. No. Speaking, pork speaking chop of the. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, George, speaking of the tapper, was our uh, free DV buddies over there this year? I I didn't see the same guy, but I I believe there was some free DV stuff there in the booth. Yeah. Cool. If you, cool. If you come to Huntsville, it's a, it's a great ham fest, but you don't go for the food. Oh, you can. Not in the ham fest. You no. want to go outside to the restaurant. Oh, there's great food in Huntsville, in yeah. the city there, but not inside the... Uh, Von yeah. Braun Center. Well, there's only so many hot dogs, corn dogs that you, know, <laughs> that you would want in a weekend. I, I'm not sure what they've got there, but it, it, yeah, it's typical ham fest fare. It's not, uh, not, not like what you got there at um, at Hamvention. But another great Hamvention is in the books. Uh, thanks to Dara and the whole team that put that on this year. They did an excellent job. The uh, the fairgrounds. Worked out great this year. Plenty of room. Weather was very cooperative. So, um, yeah, we may have to do that one again next year. So, with that, a couple of things on the way out the door I want to mention. That is our social media sites for Amateur Logic. You can catch us at facebook.com slash group slash amateurlogic.tv. You can follow us on Twitter at Amateur Logic. You can also find us at groups.io slash G slash Amateur Logic. Okay. And if you want show notes, because some people don't put links in their segments, not calling out anyone in particular here, uh, probably <laughs> myself included, you can find those amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. We publish all the show notes right there. You can find the links and what was in each episode. Um. You might even find something else in there. We didn't even. You could find that. all kind of stuff in there. Yeah. You just, yeah. Whatever the who, whatever the guy that does the show notes, we keep decides to put in there. Whoever that <laughs> yep. guy may be, they must pay that guy a lot of money because there's so much content in there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. a high paying gig. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks for being here, everyone. Join us again. Around the middle of next month for another Amateur Logic, and probably this coming weekend, which is June something. Huh? <laughs> On June the something for the next time college. That is going to be... That's going to uh, be June the 2nd. June the 2nd. Okay. Yeah. Strike that, yeah. not June Hopefully the something. Hopefully we can get June back on track after that. I get hope back so. on schedule, because yeah. these uh, kind of messed me up. Yeah. And everybody else, too. Yeah. All right. Thanks for being here, everyone. 7-3. Seven, 7-3, three. Seven, three, everybody. Seven, Good night. 7-3.
Cena, I like how you've done this because now you've kind of tethered me so I can't roam around with it unless right. I'm dragging you around. <laughs> hey, but there again, George is small enough. I can pick him up and move well, with him. Right? He could. You know, I wouldn't want her getting a wrestling match with 